<laughs> okay, great. <clears throat> okay, so we uh, now going to talk a little bit about implementing the uh, dynamics. So we're going to get more in sort of revisit questions of like scheduling and uh, implementation, um, especially when we talk about the parallel. But before we talk about the parallel, let's do something e slightly easier, which is the how we would take the paradigm we're talking about, uh, mapping it, it into a, an efficient sequential algorithm. So the goal is, well, if it's sequential, we can ignore the span. We didn't need to do it. Uh, but we'd like algorithms to work in time proportional to the work. Okay, so the minimum edges distance, we'd like it to be the product of the two sizes of the two strings, uh, ideally without making too many modifications to the uh, code that we had written. Okay, what I'm going to show here is something that doesn't involve any changes to the language or compiler, but we do, we're going to have to syntactically change it a little bit uh, just to make it work. Uh, you could imagine having, in fact, this, you'll see the syntactic changes I make could trivially be done automatic if you had some, uh, automatically if you had some pre-processing or some part of your compiler that did it uh, for you. But I'm basically going to wrap some wrappers around the code so that it gets memoized correctly. Okay, and I'm going to do this with side effects. So under the hood, there's going to be side effects. And of course, that means when we move to the parallel world, we have to be much more careful. We can't just say, oh, it's going to run in parallel because there's going to be race conditions, and if we're not careful, we'll get uh, complete garbage. <clears throat> okay, so in the sequential setting, this is probably not, you could probably come up what we're going to do on your own, but what we'll do is then we'll build on, on this to come up to the, uh, to the parallel setting. So first of all, we're going to assume that we have some table implementation, hash table or something. So we have some table. <coughs> Okay, and what it does is it's going to support, uh, uh, you know, the standard operations in particular. It's going to in, in support a find and an insert. Okay, and since our arguments are integers, it's going to be a find and insert on tuples of integers. So some of our functions, you notice, had a like Fibonacci had a single integer, and the other ones we discussed uh, had. Uh, uh, two integers. So when I do a find, and let's say I was doing this for min minimum edit distance, this would be on the pair, you know, the i and the j. And the insert is going to be on an i and j. And what we're going to put into the hash table is what we normally do with memoization, we're going to put the value. So we're going to say for MED of ij, it, its return value is 27. And we're going to store it in the hash table. So we're going to assume this is the case. And we're also going to assume this hash table is efficient in the sense that it's order one, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, in, insertion, fine. Now, technically, to do this, um, it would be order one in expectation. Because if we're going to use a hash table, we have to use, you know, random hashes. And so uh, this is actually order one in, you know, expectation. <coughs> And, um, but that's okay, because w when we were talking about work stealing, all of our bounds were in expectation anyway because of the randomization work stealing. So we're going to assume that we have this. So we're going to have, I'm going to call it table dot <coughs> find and table dot insert. Uh, I guess I'm also going to have a, a table dot new that just creates a new empty table. <clears throat> okay, so what I'm going to do is define this memoize function, which is a magic function which has a weird type to it. It's going to be, let's say, A, basically arg is going to be my arg type, so A equals arg type, and B equals result type. So for minimum edit distance, A would be a pair of integers, right? My I and my J, and the result type would be an integer, right? In some cases, we had booleans as a result type uh, just to say whether it was possible or not in the case of the subset sum problem. <clears throat> so this is going to have some type which goes from A to B. Okay, so it takes a function that maps arguments to values and returns another function which Returns arguments values. 
And that's an argument to another one that takes arguments to values. So that's a little bit of a messy type there. Our original, you know, we're trying to generate a function that returns, that takes uh, arguments to values, and we pass it in here. And it's because we're going to be basically passing in, well, you'll see how it works in a, in a second. So that's the type of this thing. And we're going to wrap this around our code, okay? And let me just show how we're going to use it, okay? So what we're going to do is, when the way that we're going to use it is, let me show an example for Fibonacci. I'm going to create my Fibonacci function by wrapping it in this memoize. Okay. And the, the memoize function is going to look like this. Uh, oh, sorry. It's going to take some arguments. <coughs> And it's going to, then it's going to look exact. From now on, it looks exactly like our original uh, uh, Fibonacci. So it's going to say, if n is less than or equal to 1, then 1, else, fib. And what's important here is that it's a fib prime. OK, it's this fib. And on n um, minus 1 plus fib. OK, I think that's it. So the only difference, if you were, our original Fibonacci just said fib of n, blah. So we've sort of basically added this uh, funkiness here with the memo eyes. And I guess there's a close bracket for closing the memo eyes. <coughs> OK, it might not even be obvious that this is type correct in the sense that this actually has the type, the memo eyes has the type I claim it is. Um, but it does, okay? So, in some sense, the way this, this, and I could basically, this would be the same for all the examples I did. I claim if I wrap this memoize function is, I'm going to describe you how to implement memoize, I'm going to get something that does all the proper memoization and does work proportional to the number of unique function calls. Now, what's going on here is, <coughs> Fn, is what I'm doing is I'm passing is what, what memoize is going to do, it's going to build a memoized version, right? My original function here is I'm memoized. It's going to basically create a memoized version and then pass it in, right, to this function f. And so now what happens is recursively it's going to be calling the memoized version of it. Intuitively that's how this is going to work, okay? <clears throat> Like I said, this is, would be the same whether we're going to do the sequential or parallel. It would work in either case. Uh, I'm first going to just show you this, the thing that's safe for sequentially, and in fact would crash and burn if you tried to run it in parallel, uh, but will work sequentially. By the way, this is the great about functional programming. We can pass around functions in all sorts of crazy ways. It all works. We don't have to put funky uh, you know, at symbols in to say whether it's by value or equals. Have any of you done C, C lambdas? Or <laughs> lambdas in C++ are not a whole lot of fun. <clears throat> OK, so we've got um, this fun mem memorize. OK, and it takes this f as an argument. Um, okay, the first thing we do is create a, um, a table. Okay. And this is going to be statically created, not in every time I call Fibonacci. It's basically when I this memoize here is going to be run, right? So I'm going to basically run memoize on this function. And once, it was going to create this, this table. So this gets created once here. So this is just simply going to be, and I'm going to put the table in a ref cell. 
Okay. Because I'm going to assume that the table is, uh, yeah. <coughs> and uh, so this is going to be my table dot new, my function I, I defined up there. I'm creating a new empty table. Call it my cache, because that's where I'm going to st store all the memo values. <coughs> Then I'm going to create a memoized version of uh, effectively this Fibonacci or whatever it is I put in here. So this is going to be fun mem, and it takes an argument. So it's end, going to end up being this fib prime here that gets passed in. So this mem is going to be the thing I pass in to the fn, so it takes the argument. And it's going to be memoized in the sense that I'm going to put some checks. I'm going to see if I've run it before. And if I have, I'm going to return the old value. And if I have, haven't, I'm going to run it and then store, store it in the uh, table. Right? So I'm going to do some case table dot find on my arg. And I guess I need to specify the table to, I guess, on the cache. It's not arg. <coughs> And since the, this is in a ref cell, I have to do bang cat. By the way, do you know, have you, did you learn last week how to use ref cells in ML or? No? Okay. So just to make sure this, what a ref cell is, this is a mutable cell. So this basically is creating, I'm put, wrapping around some mutable cell that I'm going to put a value in. Okay, so I'm allowed to side effect this, and the way I'm going to do that is with a colon equal. Okay, so if I say ref some, something A, and if A is a ref cell, colon equal X, it's going to side effect this value here with X. Okay, so this is just a part of standard ML. Okay, and uh, what bang does is it just grabs the value from inside the ref cell. So it's just going to pull out that value. So the interface for a ref cell is ref creates <coughs> uh, bang reads and colon equal assigns. <coughs> so there's mutation going on here. So of course this would not be safe in parallel because of race conditions, etc. <coughs> so basically, if I find it. Um, this find is going to return, takes these two arguments, and it's going to return uh, sum if it found it, and none if it doesn't. In particular, it's going to return sum of the value that it found, sum r, and I just return r. So like I said, this is the memoized version of the function. It says, if I've already evaluated at that argument, I just return it immediately. Otherwise, um, I have to then evaluate it. So that's going to be the, the other condition here. It's going to be none. And then what I do is I evaluate it. So I let val result equals <coughs> OK, here's where it's like a little tricky how this works. And it, it takes a little while is what I'm doing is, remember this f here is this fm fib prime of n. So it takes two argument. It takes a function as an argument, and it takes the original argument, right? So what I'm doing is I'm passing into this fm fib prime here my memoized version. And the reason is, is now when I call this fib prime here and this fib prime here, it's going to be this function that's properly memoized. And so, when I call it here, I'm going to be passing in to the memoize. Okay. For those of you who've played around with the lambda calculus and tried to implement recursion in the pure lambda calculus that doesn't have recursion, this is similar to the trick that you would do. I mean, you can either use a Y combinator or you can basically pass the function itself. Okay. And in this case, I'm not passing the function itself. I'm passing the, the function its memoized version. Okay. <clears throat> So this is going to evaluate Fibonacci 
but with the memoized per version plugged in here and here, so when it goes in there, it'll, it'll check the right version. <coughs> so I do that, and then I also have to update the table, and so that's going to be my colon equals here. So I'm going to say cache colon equals um, insert t table dot insert. and arg and r. So I'm inserting into the ca cache at location arg with key arg value r. By the way, the table here, yeah, okay. Any questions? And then I just f return r, right? And then this whole thing, there was some let up here, so the whole thing is in an in mem and okay. So that's what memoize is. That's the whole thing. I claim if you just implement this, uh, you will get Im efficient implementations of every example we've given sequentially. Uh, all you have to do is wrap this memoize around the examples we did like this. And that's it. You're done. You've got efficient uh, versions of those dynamic programs. <coughs> okay. I should notice that this this is returning this mem here, which is a func. Well, I can now apply this. So if I wanted to apply fib, right, this mem has the right type. It takes just an argument, right? <coughs> so going back up to this. <coughs> I can now apply fib to 7, and it's going to give me 21, as it turns out. <coughs> because fib is this, is, I've just returned this mem, it takes an argument. <coughs> and so in this memoize, basically what fib is going to be, is sort of this, this, by the way, if I take parent, the way that parentheses are matched, I'm basically returning this function. which will then take this argument here. <coughs> yeah? Good. That's exactly, very good. That's exactly the, the next topic. So what I'm saying is this is only safe sequentially. This is not safe to run in parallel. So if I put right now, uh, <coughs> What I would do to run it in parallel, right, if I go back to my uh, Fibonacci is, well, let me rewrite the parallel version of this, right, is I wouldn't actually just do a plus here, in, at least in the way that Amut's been doing with the double lines. Is, you know, I could write this as, you know, let, I know, let's call it A, B equals Fib of N minus 1 parallel with Fib n minus 2 to make it, now we're making it clear what's running in parallel. We're making those two calls in parallel, uh, you know, in a plus b, right? So run those two things in parallel and return them. If in our code, for example, in our library, you, you use this parallel call like this, it would actually run these two in parallel. And if you used it with this implementation of memoize, uh, you're likely to get complete garbage. There'll be a race condition. Uh, who knows? I don't even know what would happen. It'd be nasty. Okay. <coughs> core dump, right? Uh, I guess ML doesn't core dump, but I don't know. it'll raise some exception somewhere. Who knows? Probably in the scheduler, which is you know as bad as a core dump. <coughs> Okay, so now I guess for the rest of the time we're going to talk about how, which is sort of interesting, how would you actually make this safe for parallelism so that we actually get uh, ideally the work and the span bounds and, you know, like I said, uh, the goal would be to get this W over P plus uh, span or sometimes we call S and some, that's, well, let's call S for span. Sometimes I've been calling that D. <coughs> 
which means I can't waste any. In order to get this work, this sort of balance, I can't waste any work. Right? I can't spend too much time doing different things, and I can't change the critical path. Okay. What I'm going to do you is a, a solution that works. It's not 100% general. It turns out there is a solution that works in general. I'm going to show you one that works as long as you only have a constant number of uh, calls to the same. So in MED, <coughs> I can have MED and I and J. And we say this sharing. It turns out all the examples we did today, the amount of sharing is at most two. That there's at most two places that we'll call MED of I and J. And the reason why is you can think of uh, it as a DAG. <coughs> So if this is S along this dimension and T along here, it's basically, and this is the size of S and the size of T. <laughs> this thing makes two recursive calls to here and here, right? If it doesn't match, if the last character, or maybe it would make a call if it did match. Let's just assume it doesn't match. And so it makes these two calls, and then this one will make two calls here and here. So everyone makes two calls, but if you notice, everyone can only be called by two people, two different locations. This one can be called from here and here, and it can call here and here. Okay. Well, it's either going to be called from here and here, or I guess maybe it, it could be called from here. Well, I guess maybe three locations, okay, but it's a constant number. <clears throat> Any questions? Okay, so we're going to look at I'm going to leave this up here and erase the Fibonacci. Okay, so let's first identify what can go wrong if we use this in parallel. Okay, can someone tell me a few things that could go go wrong? Yeah? Two calls to insert. I could make two calls to insert, right? Uh, and who knows what happens, right? It'd get corrupted, yeah. Okay, so the first thing is we need to make the table concurrent, say for concurrency. And there's a term that's used that, that some of you might have heard. It's called linearizable. How many have heard of the term linearizable? OK, some set. It basically means that the operations have to act like they were atomic. So if I do multiple inserts and finds, I, it doesn't define which interleaving. It has to be consistent with some interleaving, atomic interleaving of those instructions. So if, if one processor says insert, another says find, another says insert, Right, let's call this A, my three operations. And they're all happening in parallel. Because there's some scheduler, it's non-deterministic which one happens first, right? Maybe, remember that we had some work-stealing scheduler. It picked random numbers. If I ran it on Monday, maybe it'd run this one first. If I ran it on Tuesday, it'd run this one, OK? But if it's linearizable, if it always acts like it's some interleaving, so it's either going to act like it's A, B, C, or it's going to act like it's A, C, B, or it's maybe B, C, you know, B, A, C, any of those, but it has to act like it's atomic. So it has to act like this whole insert happened before the find and before the other insert. Okay? And that's what it means for the, this uh, particular data structure to be linearizable, is that the operations have to look atomic. And there's a whole bunch of work on linearizable data structures for all sorts of things. There's a whole book, Herlihy and uh, uh, Shavit have a very nice book that's called Multiprogramming, et cetera. And they go through dozens of linearizable data structures, including tables. 
Okay, they have a skip list implementation. Uh, other people have done hash, you know, skip list might, you might lose, lose a log n factor. Other people have done hash table implementations. But we're going to take it for granted that this can be done. So I'm not going to give you a concurrent implementation of ta tables. We're just going to assume that the operations are atomic. And this is possible to do. Okay. If we use a hash, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so that's a very good question. Are linearized data structures slow? And the answer is, by the way, nearly all the work in linearized data structures have been on lock-free linearized data structures. So they don't involve a lock. And whether they're slow or not depends on the contention. Okay. Like how many people are accessing the same element. So let's imagine we implement this with a hash table. If uh, the arguments are different, they're going to go to random different locations in the hash table. There's not going to be contention. So you can actually make this so it's reasonably fast, okay? And part of the reason I was assuming that there's not many people that can call, call the same location here was to avoid uh, contention on this location, right? Because I don't want too many people trying to insert the exact same thing at the same time uh, because they, there could be contention and delay, okay? <coughs> so that's a good question. I'm not gonna be able to describe how these uh, data structures work, but... Uh, Probably if you look at a distributed hash table also, basically it, it's an important correctness condition of any hash table is that if you insert two things, you would want them to look like they were both inserted. If it's not linearizable, it could look like you get some weird, maybe another thing is deleted or something like that or gets into all sorts of weird things. <clears throat> um, so we're going to assume this table's uh, uh, linear, linearizable, and they are very efficient, actually, implementations of linearizable hash table. Especially if all you're doing is insert, in, include deletes, then it becomes more complicated. But we don't even need a delete here. We just need an insert and, and find. <coughs> so I'm just going to take this for great, granted. So let's now assume that those inserts and finds are safe that if I apply them in parallel, someone will win. So if two people try to insert at the same time, if they're two different locations, they'll both get properly inserted. If they do the same location, uh, one of them, well, because we're using it for memorizing, they're going to be inserting the same value anyway. So it'll get properly inserted. <laughs> so there's still something wrong, even if we have safe uh, <coughs> Uh, tables here. Can someone tell me what's still wrong? Ne okay, sure, you can do it again. <laughs> well, I'd say two things. First, you're still doing the extra work of providing two threads okay. in the same thing. I don't think it's a huge problem. Here is the table. Is, I, you were talking about this, so I don't know if you imply it's properly implemented. Because insert wouldn't do it, it has to be an insert or update. Uh, an insert. Insert or update. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Basically, because you're still going to be, that might be well atomic, uh -huh. but if you allow the colon to the non to happen, you're still going to call insert twice. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the second one better behave as an update. It's going to switch the same number in the memoized table. So, so let's say that's okay. So if I do, let's say that the insert, the first time I insert some value, it, it goes from empty to that value. And if I insert it, I'm always going to insert the same value. And let's say that works, and it'll just unchange it. OK, so let's say that's safe. That's the, I'm worried about something else here. Yeah? Uh, so we are still wasting code because um, the, the, at the time you check that the entry is not exist, and then you spend some time uh, computing f, and, and, that, and you only insert it after you get the value. So between that, someone else can call the same value, and you still find Good. It. Perfect. So that's the problem is. Uh, if we didn't care about efficiency, actually, I claim that this would work. We would be done at this point. This were, if, well, all I have to do is make a linearizable, and it would work correctly. Your program would run, uh, but it would not be efficient. We would not be able to prove this at all because we're going to be wasting a bunch of work. 
exactly for what was described, is what can happen is two people can ask for the same location, right? One can come in and say, I've been evaluated. So it's going to start evaluating. And by the way, evaluating this is very expensive. Because if this was, let's say it was big, it has to evaluate this whole piece down here, right? It's some big DAG, and to evaluate an MED of this thing that's towards the end, let's say this actually came in from this side, is very expensive. So th what's going to happen is this recursive call goes here, it makes a recur recursive call, and it starts evaluating it. Then this one also makes a recursive call here, for example, because it's parallel. Remember, it's going to make these two calls in parallel. This is not here. And then this makes a recursive here. These two are going to be in parallel, and those two in parallel. They both want this value. One of them is going to start evaluating it. The other one's going to come here. It's not ready yet, and it's going to evaluate it. So it's going to be redundant work. They're both going to evaluate it. And this is going to happen a lot because, like I said, this piece of work here is some giant piece of work. It's going to be a long time before that's done. And two people, so one's going to go through it, and another one, it's, it's going to be a mess. Okay. So we have to avoid this redundant work. We have to somehow make sure it's done only once. And this starts looking a little bit like actually laziness in the sense that a laziness, if you have two uh, points in your program that want to force a value, whoever gets there first is going to force it, and the second one's going to see the value that's, uh, that's uh, done, and you want to make sure that they don't both evaluate it. So somehow we want to make sure that we don't do redundant work. Does anyone have a suggestion of how we might do that? Uh -huh. Yes. So, yeah. So we want to basically, the first person that comes in, we want to basically lay claim to it. That they say, I own this now. It's my responsibility for evaluating this. So, and that itself, that laying claim has to be linearizable itself. So these two may be at exactly the same time, say, I want to lay claim to this, this location. We have to make sure that's linearized in the sense it has to look like one of them wins. Um, so one of them has to get a, a response that says, yes, you've got it. Go, go do your stuff. And the other one has to get a response that says, no, someone's working on it. Okay. And in fact, there's effectively three responses that you can get, right? <clears throat> so we basically want to modify find, right, so that it res responds in three different ways. We either want to come back and say empty or busy, which I guess is what we said on none. Before we had sum and none, so this is to replace sum and num or busy, or, you know, uh, let's call it full of value. So there's three possibilities. One is you're the first person ever to, to try to evaluate this location. And like I said, and the other is someone already laid claim, but they haven't actually done it yet. They're busy working on it. They're going to eventually finish it. And the third is uh, someone laid claim and actually completely finished it, and now it's actually got a value inside. OK. Is that clear? What's... OK, so these two, I claim, are the easy cases, because if it's empty, I'm effectively going to just do exactly as I did before, as I'm going to do this second half. It's like a not the none here. I'm going to start evaluating it. And when it's done, I'm now going to, I'm going to have to, when it's done, I'm going to basically transition to that state. I'm going to fill it, right? So instead of doing a uh, cache colon equal table insert, I would, uh, <coughs> there would be some other way. I guess I'd mark it. Well, there's various different ways. But I'd ha somehow have to transition from busy to full value. I think I, uh, Okay, so 
that's the idea is that if I come in first, I go from empty to busy, and then uh, if, I, if I actually, uh, the one that laid claim to it, then I fully evaluate it, and later I'm going to actually insert the value. Now, the question is, the harder part is, what happens if I come in and I'm <coughs> empty? I'm sorry, if I come in and I uh, request the value and I get busy back. I get the fact that someone else is working on it. What do you suggest doing? A busy loop. Does that sound like a good thing to do? Does someone think that that's... How many th think that's a, a perfectly reasonable thing to do? <laughs> Fail. <laughs> if we busy loop, there's no... Remember, we have to somehow account for the work, right? We've got this... Uh, work stealing scheduler that's like uh, you know sharing work among the processes. We want to show that the total work done by all the processes is maintained by our algorithms here. If I do a busy thing, we're adding work to the computation. We're basically going to sit. It's almost as bad as computing it twice. We're going to say, okay, I'm not going to compute it twice, but I'm going to wait till this whole person's done, and during the time I'm tying up that processor, it can't do anything useful. Okay. And so there's no way I'd be able to prove my bounds because uh, this process is tied up. It's like locked up. Now, it's, it's not, you're not going to go in a deadlock because you can argue that there's always the only way that you could be uh, busy waiting is if someone else is working. So you won't get into a deadlock, but you will waste a lot of work okay, because you're sitting there. So what, what do you suggest we do in this case? Good. What we have to do is basically we have to uh, uh, associate. So there's going to be this thing here, which is going to have some at the beginning. Let's say it's either going to be uh, uh, <coughs> you know, busy. If I do this fine, it's going to return you know, something that's uh, you know, busy. <coughs> or later, it's going to be have a, uh, a full with some value in it. <coughs> And what I do is I'm going to need, when it's busy, I'm going to have a linked list here to a set of continuations. And a continuation is just a, something I'm going to run. I effectively have to suspend. What I want to do is, if this person comes in and it's busy, I want to suspend it and say, go to sleep, go off to the side, don't waste any resources, and I'll wake you up at some later time. Okay. So what this is going to be is, is this is so-called continuation, okay. which in functional language is easy, at least in things like ML, it's easy to create a continuation. And it's effectively just a, a thunk. It's a function which uh, you can later apply to unit. You apply to no argument, and it'll start rerunning. Okay. So you have to suspend. Create a continuation, and, uh, and let's say I just have some linked list of these. Now, <clears throat> this is again where I'm assuming there's only going to be a, a, some constant number of people uh, doing here. So then I'm basically I'm assuming this linked list can be at most constant length. The length of this is going to be at most the number of people who ask for this value, minus one. Right? Because the first one is never going to insert themselves in here. Because they're the one that's making it busy. The other ones uh, could insert themselves into this. So what you do is when you come in, uh, you check if it's uh, empty. And you atomically update to busy. Which means you, if multiple do people are doing this at the same time, one of them will win. Okay. If you get back that it's busy, then you go add yourself to here. And it turns out that adding yourself to here is actually quite easy to do it in a linearizable way. Because two people could add themselves to here at the same time. You, you might worry about uh, one of them getting lost. In fact, it's almost trivial to do a uh, add yourself to a linked list. 
safely? What instruction would you use? For those of you who know some concurrency, yes. a CAS, compare and swap. Okay. A compare and swap is an atomic operation. It says you look at this value and then you try to compare yourself into here. And if it changed in the meantime, you will fail and you try again. And again, because if there's a most a constant number in here, you'll fail at most a constant number of times. So you just use a compare and swap instruction. Compare and swap, and swap instructions built into every single computer you, that exists. Okay, either that or load link store conditional, which is equivalent. So adding yourself atomically onto this list, that's easy. So I add, I basically suspend myself. Okay, all the, the, per, the basically the system will have to suspend. So somewhere in this code, I'm not gonna write down the code because it's, it becomes quite messy. Somewhere in this code says if, you know, if I come back and it's busy, then I uh, create a continuation. Okay, SML actually has uh, various routines for doing that for you, which basically says create the, uh, what I'm gonna do, what I would have done afterwards. <clears throat> or you can even actually just create, in this case, you could just create a lambda, a thunk, and you would say, um, yeah, this is what I'm gonna do uh, when I return. You add it to the linked list here, and then you, uh, then you basically finish, from the point of view of the ske scheduler, you say, I've now added myself to the list, I just end, and now the scheduler is going to come back and say, oh, now this processor has uh, uh, finished its work, I'm going to know that that particular processor is going to do work stealing and look for some other work, right? It's equivalent to just an, a normal job finishing and then the scheduler looking for something else. And again, it could either be local work from the local stack, right? We talked about work stealing. Everyone has its own stack of work or its queue of work and you, <coughs> basically push and pop from, from one side and other people steal from the other side. So when you suspend yourself, you basically go look for some other work. Okay, this, this is not within the model of work stealing, right? In work stealing, you don't have suspending threads. Like, it's definitely work, for example. This is within the model of work stealing, yeah. Because I would just suspend. Are you able to do it internally within the thread? Within the thread, you would just finish. You'd push yourself onto this tag, yeah. The, the harder part is the, the waking up. Let's, let's talk about it in a yeah. second. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we have resources, right? So we have a resource, but we are not using it and we are just running it busy. Uh, but we have a resource, but we are not using it and we are just making it busy. Can we do some other, can we ask it to do some other work? It will. That's what I'm saying. The work stealing scheduler will automatically do that, right? So let's say, look at a fork join. What happens in fork join is you fork two things off. And at some later point, they join back together, right? What's going to happen in practice is one of these things finish first, right? <clears throat> and what you have to do is whoever finishes last will wake this up. Whoever finishes first has to, uh, whoever finishes last can, can, can run the continuation. So let's say this one finishes last. <clears throat> when it's done, it will say, oh, the other one's done. I can then continue on here. Whoever finishes first here, has nothing to do because it's uh, uh, finished, and it can't run this because it's waiting for that. So it basically finishes its job here and has to go work, look for more work. Okay. It's similar to that. Is at any point, in this case, I'm gonna just finish the, if I, if I find it's busy, I'm gonna push myself on here, I'm just gonna finish my work, and I'm now going to go look on my, on my queue for work. Now, there might be nothing in here, in which case I'll steal from someone else. That's what, yeah, that's the, that's the way that Umut described it on, 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 on Monday, is that when you fork in work stealing, I don't have the Fibonacci code up there anymore. But when you make your two calls Fibonacci, one get pushed on a stack and the other one uh, gets run immediately. Which is an optimization because you could just push them on both on the stack and then go look for work. But of course then you just pull one of them immediately off the stack. Okay. And it's the same actually when you finish here. If you're the last one to finish, you could actually suspend yourself, uh, push the continuation on the stack because it's now ready 
and then go look for new work, and of course you'd pull that rate off again. So just don't even bother pushing it on. Yeah. No, no, you don't, you, don't push this, you don't push this work on the stack. This is the continuation that says what to do when you're done. It does not go on the work stealing scan. It goes on this linked list that's associated with this particular cell in your hash table. This is the IJ, so this is 27.6. It says, I'm evaluating uh, MED at 27.6. These are the things which came in and found it busy and therefore suspended themselves. They are not on the work stealing queue. So you ask, so there's two places where there's suspended jobs. One of them is on the work stealing queue, and one of them is in the link, link list. In both cases, the way that you start a suspended job is a suspended job is going to be effectively a thunk, something that takes no arguments and just starts running. <coughs> Okay, so that's what you do when you find it busy. Now, of course, the other side of this is when you're done with the computation, when you've actually finished here, so I guess this would be at this point in the code, here we just returned R. What else do I have to do if I've done this thing with suspensions? Yeah? Well, when somebody is done doing the work, mm -hmm. Good. So as soon as this guy is done, it's going to now swap this from busy to uh, full with a value. And that's effectively here, right? So I, I assign, I have, to, you know, I have to diddle this a little bit to be, you know, mark it as full. <coughs> and uh, that's one thing I have to do, but I have to do an additional thing, which is wake these things up. Here's the second place where having, uh, having this restriction where I have only a constant number is going to make it easier. Okay. Because if I have a constant number here, I can just push those onto my work stealing stack. If I have an arbitrary number here, like a linear number, I could still push them into my work stealing stack, but they'll take me forever because I'd have to push them in one by one. Okay. Now, there are ways to fix this, and I think this is the issue that Amut was bringing up. But then, you know, I, I could basically put this in a tree, and I could then fork them off, but it becomes more complicated. Yeah? This, by the way, this implementation is identical to what's needed for futures. Okay, so I didn't bring, at the beginning of the lec lecture, I mentioned this is similar to futures. The only difference between this and futures is um, I have a, ca a hash table wrapped around it. But if you have a future, by the way, for those who don't know, a future is a, is a parallel construct where I can basically say, fork a job, right, and give me a handle to the result of that job immediately and return immediately. And then what I can do is, uh, I can do some work, and then when eventually I need that, the result of that thing, then I ask for it. I say, it, touch, or it's sometimes called. And if it's done computation, I get it immediately. Otherwise, I have to wait for it to finish. That's just like this case. It's basically the busy, is if I ask for this value, so I've forked off this thing, and it's going off doing computing, uh, and then you know, for a while I don't need it, then I come back and I say, now I need it. If it's not done, I'm going to get a busy back. Okay. If it's done, I'm going to get a full back. Okay. And if it gets a busy, just like here, I'm going to have to suspend it to be work efficient. Now, in practice, a lot of implementations of futures, what they do is they, they'll run a little uh, a busy loop for some number of cycles. Because it's expensive to suspend, right? You have to create a thong, create some data structures, blah, blah. So you might just wait some number of cycles to see if it happens to finish in those cycles and then suspend. Uh, and we can do the exact same trick here. So yeah, so this part of it is very much the same as an implementation of, of futures. And in fact, it's very much the same also as the implementation of what were called I structures. How many of you have heard of I structures? Or One of you. <laughs> Isn't Arvind talking here next week? Or? Uh, yeah, he is, right? So he, he invented I-structures as part of the id programming language. 
Okay, and it had uh, similar features uh, as futures and this, is that you basically, you request for a value and you wait for until it's done. <clears throat> so this comes up, this idiom comes up a lot. So yeah, anyway, when you, um, when this person finishes, writes in a full, and as long as this list is small, it can just put, push it on its local stack. In fact, it can keep the last one um, for itself, I guess. Uh, no, I, I guess it, it can't because it, it actually has to run its own continuation, right? Because as you finish here, you actually want to run some more code for yourself, right? So these two will have to go on your work stealing stack, or queue. You'd basically push them on the bottom here. And now those are ready, now available for someone else to steal. And so until now, these things were unavailable to run. As soon as you push them on here, they become available to run, and then it, they could be stolen immediately. You push it on here, immediately someone comes in, steals it, and starts running it, which is safe now, because when it starts running, it's going to now look up the value in the hash table, and it still has to do a find, because it has to find this new value that was written, this full V. It's going to come and look this up, and it's going to guarantee this is full because it won't have been woken up unless this is full. And then it just returns, right? Because that's the whole point is once I've got the value, I can return. And that's the whole. That's it. So I, I'm not going through de details here, but uh, the basic parts of it is there's three parts. One is I have to have this no notion of busy. The second is if I come in and it's busy, I have to push myself onto a something associated with that busy cell, not the stack, the work stack, but something associated with that, and suspend, which means that someone else will, the process will come in and start doing something else. And when I switch from uh, busy to full, I have to wake up the suspended guys. That's it. Mm -hmm. Don't you think laziness will handle this almost automatically? Are you being sarcastic? <laughs> The answer is no. <laughs> um, at what level do you, would you write this? Would this be the scheduler, or do you need to write this in your algorithm? Or? Well, it would definitely not be written in the user algorithm. Okay. It, would be, uh, it would have to be integrated with the scheduler, right? because just putting these continuations in, uh, you could probably layer a, a level of abstraction on top of the scheduler that you don't have to go deep down in the schedule to do it. But you'd need some way to uh, basically make a call out to the scheduler that says push a job, right? Because when I'm done, I have to push these jobs here, right? And you have to be able to make a call out to the scheduler that says suspend, which means basically, uh, you know, uh, uh, stop executing, okay? Um, and it would be done in some library Right, whoever impl same, you know, someone implemented this. Again, this is not user code. This is something that's shared in a, in a library. The user would never see this. This would code, which is now 10 lines here, would all, all of a sudden become 50 lines, right? And it would make out these, I think the only two interfaces to the schedule it needs is this, uh, you know, basically a way to push things on and a way to suspend. <clears throat> It would, not at the user level, okay. So um, what I could do is I could define a cost semantics which were based on the high level fib code we were writing before, which uh, didn't know anything about this. Calculate the work and span as we did before. And then I would have to prove that this is efficient in the implementation. The user wouldn't have to know, so not the user, but there was a third party would once and for all say that uh, if you can prove its work and span as we did in the simple way with Fibonacci's, I can then guarantee this bound in my implementation. And I claim the implementation I describe would guarantee that bound under the condition we decide that's a constant fan in here. Because the sorts of problems we could get into is if this was uh, long, I could add, add span to what my otherwise little span, because there'd be all of these things would have to, have to be started up. Okay, there'd also be the issue with contention, 
where when with a bunch of people are trying to update this at the same time, they would contend and uh, I would have to pay you know, time linear in the contention. Um, and those would add costs. But if this is bounded here, then everything I'm here doesn't wa only waste the constant amount of work. So theoretically, at least, right? there might be overheads. If you did this at too fine a grain, there'd be pretty big constant overheads. So you'd have to be careful. But <clears throat> Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It does. Yeah. So proving memory is optimized, and so so the question here is that there are theoretical bounds that you can show about work stealing is that it doesn't use too much memory. Okay. Those bounds actually do break in this case. So you'd have to, there's actually, uh, we've done some work on showing bounds, but they're not, not as strong in the case of, of this sort of thing. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so you the memory will be implemented by third party. Yeah. Um, so only thing I kind of remains in my project, what I'm thinking is uh, how for uh, any arbitrary data structure, the table dot insert have a good hash function yeah, so that's why I, at the beginning, restricted ourselves to integer uh, uh, you know, arguments. You're right, if I then start allowing for uh, uh, more complicated arguments, I'm going to have to guarantee the hash functions efficient and the equality, even the equality test has to be. Right? If I equal, try to you know, test two arbitrary things as they equal, that could be very expensive. Um, so by limiting myself to just integer arguments, I can guarantee the hash function is fast and that the quality test is fast. Otherwise, it, it, it's more difficult. Now, probably in practice, what you'd do is you'd uh, so-called functorize it in the sense that you would create a, uh, a, 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 some functor way for, where you'd create your own memoize would be specialized on this table, and this table could be a table of any type, right? And you would then have to guarantee that that it's efficient yourself. Any other questions about? OK, so that's at least an outline of how the implementation, to give you a sense that this could be done at least in, uh, the theoretically efficiently. Uh, we're not going to waste any work. We're not going to add anything to the span. Because as soon as we, uh, it's ready, this thing's going to start up immediately. We're going to, it's going to be ready to start up immediately. So if all these processes are idle, as soon as I push these on here, almost immediately they'll be taken. It's very likely that someone among here will randomly pick this one, at least within two steps or something. <clears throat> OK, I just wanted to talk about one more idea, which is going in a slightly different uh, uh, direction before we finish up. By the way, this, I think this is a sort of a nice way to wrap up what we're talking about the week, because we started at the beginning talking about this cost model, and we talked about how, how to do scheduling, and now we, we come back to some of the scheduling issues here. And what I was going to finish up by is talking about one, another way to do dynamic programs, which is not quite as elegant, but it's actually more practical because it's cash efficient. Okay. And the idea is, in a dynamic program, let's look at the MED problem, minimum edit distance. And if you remember, we had, we can view this as a two-dimensional matrix, where on one side we have our S, on the other side we have our T. This is going to be size of T, size of S. You know, you know zero, dot, 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 dot. And we're trying, so basically trying to fill up this table, where IJ, this, this is our I, and this is our J. Location IJ is one of our 
In the case of the memoization, this was one of our function calls, and it depended on some, you know, either these two people, or if it was equal, it would depend on, on the one that's diagonal from it. So you either subtract, if they're not equal, if this location in T is not equal to this location in S, then you say, I'm going to take them, you know, removing one from S and removing one from T. Right, so that's what our code looked like. If they are equal, then I took the value that's diagonal here. So you have sort of a dependence graph that looks like this, right? Everyone, let's just assume that they're all not equal just for, there might be some d diagonals across here. <coughs> so people depend on people basically above and to the left of them. And remember we said that the, uh, MEDD had a span of uh, linear span and n squared work. Well, it's obviously n squared work because we have to evaluate every cell in this thing. And it's linear span because if you look at the DAG and do a level ordering of the DAG, it looks like this. Right? Th basically, this depends on <coughs> these two, and then th this, th this depends on that one. If you look at the diagonals, you can do all the diagonals. So you actually can do a bottom up. So what we've been describing is what's called top down uh, uh, dynamic program. You could do a bottom up and you could basically fill up this table diagonal by diagonal, right? Because once I've done with this diagonal, everything's ready to do the next diagonal, right? So I could fill it up along here. <laughs> And that's effectively another way to see that this has linear span. And uh, in fact, it's got the number of diagonals here. How many diagonals are there if I keep drawing, if this distance here is one? Size of S plus size of T, right? Right, because we're going to have this many diagonals going to reach here, and then we're going to start diagonals across here, right? <coughs> which is exactly what we said the span was in our other way of doing it. Okay, it's not a coincidence these are the same, as that's, that's the actual depth of the dependent stack. <coughs> the problem is if you do it this way, is that it's not very cash friendly because I basically do a whole diagonal and then I do a whole other diagonal. And so when I start working on this one, it's out of the cache. So it turns out there's a much more cache-friendly way, which is actually even sequentially a much better way and much faster way to do this in, in, uh, <coughs> in a cache-friendly manner, efficiently. <coughs> and it works well in parallel. And the idea is divide and conquer, is what I can do is I can break up my iteration space into these four quadrants. Okay. And let me call. And what I can do is I can evaluate this one doesn't depend on anything, right? So in my bottom up system, what I can do is I can, I can start and I can basically evaluate this, all the cells in here. They don't, because if I do bottom up, basically I, have, I can calculate this element, then I can calculate these, and then these. I'm basically doing, like I said, the diagonal. So I can certainly create, generate all of this without needing to know any of the values here. Is that clear? Or, yeah. Then in parallel, I can evaluate these two. I can't do this until that's done, but in parallel, I can evaluate these two. And then I can evaluate, and again, I can't do this until these two are done. And then I, th then I can do this one. Now what I have to do is when I evaluate this, I have to store, that's why I drew this little rectangle here and this one here. In order to evaluate this here, I have to have stored one column here. And in order to value this, I have to store one row here. Because everything I calculate this, remember I have some dependence. This guy here will depend on diagonal if it's equal or these two elements. And so if I depend on this, I need to have stored this value. So what I can do is define a divide, divide and conquer routine, which basically uh, does a block here and saves out these two sequences. 
And I can just write some divide and conquer algorithm. And if I do it this way, I don't even need any magic with the memoization. I'm not going to use memoization at all. I mean, it's, it's more like a bottom-up approach. I'm just going to write a function which takes any block here and its left column and its above row and returns the bottom column and the right row. So it's a function that takes this, that, and of course it takes the region of the string because it needs this little piece of the string t here and it needs this little piece of the string s. So its inputs are going to be that chunk of s, that chunk of t, this chunk, this uh, 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 part of the row, this part of a column, and it's going to return this part of a uh, row and this part of a column. If I have that, then I can write a recursive routine, which basically, uh, in recursively, it says evaluate this, evaluate these two in parallel, evaluate that. This, after this is done, these two, after those are done, this one. If I write a recurrence for this, I get work of n equals four times work of n over two. When after I've evaluated this, I need to put these two little, I've received this back, this back as a sequence, I need to append them. Appending two sequence takes linear work, so this will be plus order n. And I also have the same two on the bottom here, I basically have to copy these two blocks into one new big sequence. <coughs> this solves to, now I'm assuming here that but for simplicity that the size of n equals the size of t, and that equals uh, n. Okay, so my recurrence is a little more complicated if they're different, just to simplify things. So what this gives is, can someone tell me what that gives? That recurrence solves to? How many say n? How many say n to the 23rd? How many say n log n? How many say n squared? Okay, not that, not that many, but uh, that was the, the majority, and yes, it's order n squared. <coughs> because you got this thing that's forking four ways, <coughs> so you basically get four to the log n, and it's log n deep, right? Because we're doing four-way forking, halving each time, we get four to the log n, and that's uh, n squared. So this matches, so we get the same work as we did, which is optimal, right? As I said, it's theoretically no one knows how to do better. So the interesting part is the span here. And this is the most interesting recursion for span we've seen so far. The span of S, what's the equation for the span of S here? Remember, I'm going to do this, I have to finish this, then I do these, then I have to finish those, and then I do this. Good. Three times, exactly, S of n over 2. Plus, well, the append actually takes constant, so this is order 1 here. Even if this was log n, it doesn't change the solution. Does someone know what the result of this recurrence is? Remember the way I said to do this is you take 4 to the log base 2 of n. So what's this going to be? Yeah, it's going to, that's, that's the right answer. One way to see it is it's going to be um, 3. Because remember I got a fan out of 3 and the depth of the tree is going to be log base 2 of n. And this work is only order 1, so I can ignore that. <coughs> And by the way, this, you could, I didn't mention this, but this one turns out to be a low order term here. So I end up 3 to the log base 2 of n, which is equivalent to what you just said, which was uh, n to the log base um, 2 of 3. Uh, did I? Yeah. 
which is in, I don't know, what's log base 2 of 3? Someone have a calculator? I forget what it is. Let's, let's pretend it's 1.4. <coughs> okay, what's interesting here is that this span is not as good. Remember before we had a span of n. We now have a span of n to the 1.4. And um, this, I've lost something in the span here, but it's still quite parallel. The parallelism is going to be basically n squared work over the span, which is n log base uh, 2 of 3, approximately, let's say, n to the 0.6 or something. That's the parallelism. Which is probably still plenty, right? If, if this n is uh, 10,000, 10,000 to 0.6 is probably about 1,000. So I can make use of 1,000 processes. The big advantage of this is that it's going to get a lot of cache locality. And so what happens is when I get to a block, because I'm doing it blocked like this, is once this block fits in my cache, it's going to be completely cache friendly. I'm going to be able to do this whole block without any more cache misses. So it turns out that this is how people now implement dyna dynamic programmers. And there's been this cool work, which is a mixture of actually algorithms and programming language, which actually it's messy in some cases to write these sorts of recursion. There's all sorts of recent work on program synthesis, which takes your initial dynamic programming, almost like we written, written, wrote it in the abstract form just as a recursion, and converts it into this divide and conquer. Okay, so there's two, uh, uh, there's one group, uh, what's his name at MIT, Lutz, Lutzano? Who's the guy that does that program synthesis and uh, Lozema. Yeah, Armando, right. He has papers which basically show how you do this by using programs, things like this, do this conversion in, to generate the parallel version. Um, so anyway, uh, I thought I'd finish up with that. And um, any last questions? I guess the time. Mm -hmm. Which? Which programming model? The Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's functional in the sense that we don't do updates. Right. Uh, but it's not very functional in the way that we use a lot of arrays data and so on. I'm not sure why using arrays is non functional, right? Uh, I'm not sure why. You're, saying, so you're implying somehow that using an array is a non -func not functional programming, right? Or, yeah, well, I mean, in contrast to like, traditional sequential uh, functional programming, where you basically do reduction. Um, right. You could do everything we did without a single array using purely inductive data, you know, pairwise inductive. In fact, the very first model I described on the first day, the Lambda calculus, doesn't have arrays. We extended arrays. Um, does someone remember why we added arrays? Or Oh, can someone remember how much we would lose? Let's say I didn't add ar arrays. We can ask, how much efficiency would I lose by not adding arrays and doing everything we did? Remember, we did sequences. I, we actually have a complete tree-based implementation of sequences. And in fact, the tree-based implementation sequences, the update's a lot faster than the array-based, at least the non, we discussed about fancy array-based. But, um, and, um, but, so can someone remember why, how much we lose by doing a complete tree-based implementation of sequences? Log, log n. Because now what happens is when we do random access, we have to follow down some path of the tree, and it's going to be log n. Okay. So in fact, you can take the pure lambda calculus and argue that you can simulate any RAM algorithm with a log n loss of efficiency in work, adding no arrays. Just, you know, and then I could even do it with a type lambda calculus. I can add types. As long as I have recursive types, I can build trees. I can build a tree. I can then simulate uh, a basically random access. I can simulate my memory by just storing my whole memory in a tree and then using the index to go, go get it. So we could have done everything without arrays. 
but one of the goals in our, our course here was to match the bounds which are known uh, in the case of sequential algorithms. So when someone comes in and, and, and complains to us and says, oh, breadth first search takes linear work, but in your model it takes n log n work, um, we would like not, that not to be the case. And in order to do that, we have to add uh, random access arrays, but we add them in a semantic way that the arrays are purely uh, a side effect free. Right? And in fact, uh, Bob Harper taught the course uh, with me last fall, and he did the presentation of sequences, and he actually did this very nice thing where he said that you can actually view the sequences indu defined inductively. You can uh, you know, basically build them up. You can basically say a sequence is, you define them like a tree. You say a sequence consists of a left half and a right half, right? And so, in some sense, the semantics is separate from the implementation. We could define sequences to look more like a uh, uh, bottom-up, to semantically look more like, uh, you know, a traditional inductive definition of these types, right? Is that your qu question? Or? Arrays. If you just use trees, you mean, because of types? Is that the question, or? Yeah, I mean, here we build the abstraction of parallel sequences. Right. Use those. right. OK, it's kind of like an alternative way. Is there an alternative way to building sequences? Uh, no. I can't. I can't imagine. I mean, every, all our data structures, we need sets. Well, they, we, we can build sets. Uh, Mert talked about how to build sets and ordered sets and ordered tables. And we need some basic data structures, queues. We can ask ourselves, what are the basic data structures we need in, to design algorithms? You know, you know, priority queues, sequences, sets, maps. If you go look at any of the functional languages, they have libraries for all of those. Back to the old Lisp days, they had built-in set, sets and maps. SML has, a, has an interface for sets, maps, sequences, uh, and, uh, you know, and so do most. Haskell has these, these libraries. I mean, you need these basic data types, right? Um, whether they, it's not just sequences, when, you know, there's, like I said, there's ordered tables and ordered maps. These are all the sorts of data strikes. In fact, a sequence is a special case of an ordered, uh, ordered map, right? It's a mapping from the integers to values. So you could just view, if you don't like the term sequence or array, you can view it as a map from, from the integers 0 to n. It's a special case of a map, right? But if you're talking about reasoning, like I said, we can define uh, sequences purely inductively in, in, in a more, right? Um, any other questions? Yeah, since this is the last uh, lecture by us, if you have any general questions about the methodologies we talked about or anything of that flavor, feel free to ask. Yeah? Yeah. So I was wondering if this kind of scheduling algorithm might be good to implement with like linear or like a structural. I, I did mention that one way that linearity could help is we talked about you know these arrays where updates would be fast, right? If you had a lambda lambda calculus, that would be one way to enforce the sort of single threadedness in the sense that you would. Uh, uh, the single resource of the array, you guarantee that only a single person gets, uh, you know, access to it, right? And so, therefore, that would allow you to guarantee that it's safe to update in place. So that's certainly one place that it, it, it's useful. In fact, it's very interesting. There's with this work on futures, it turns out another place that that it's very useful to have a linear lambda calculus is if, when you create a future, you know only one person's going to use it. 
I don't even need to remember I had this linked list here. And I told you, well, I don't even know how many people are going to ask it, and that causes problems, right? I said I, I arbitrarily bounded it to some constant. If it was a linear type, if I knew only one person was going to access that future, I created a future, and if I knew, I guaranteed you that only one person was going to ask for its value, which I could do in force with a linear, you know, various linear type systems. I could then just not even create this linked list at all. I could leave a slot for the continuation here. And I would just have the single uh, person, when they, when they requested it, it's either if it was re ready, they would just take it. If it wasn't, they would put themselves in here, and it would simplify the whole set thing. So that's another application where a linear typing system uh, would, would help. And there's probably others, right? <clears throat> Any other questions? So you're saying, does the runtime? So we didn't. There's all sorts of optimizations you can add to it. In fact, there's this really cool optimization by this guy, um, Amit Ajar, or something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> I think. What, where was that paper appeared in PLTI just last week? Oh, you mean the heartbeat? Yeah, the heartbeat one. Yeah. PLDI, yeah. yeah, PLDI just last week. The idea is that. Uh, you know, we're talking about pushing these things in the queue. It can be quite expensive to push something in a queue and create a thunk. And the idea is, uh, as I understand it, and we'll probably explain it better, but uh, is that you basically delay pushing it in the queue for some amount of time. Is you basically hold on to it and you uh, only push it into the work queue after some fixed amount of time, some yeah, so heartbeat. Like is it, so traditionally, in the schedulers are are able to create one of these tasks or a thread at any point in time requested. And that becomes, that can be a huge overhead because you can design programs that keep requesting thread creation. Right, so instead of doing work, the program is spending all of its time creating all of this parallelism. This is sometimes known as uh, the curse of parallelism. There's just too much parallelism sometimes. Not just sometimes. If you recall, uh, all of these algorithms, they all do at least linear work, and their span is log square n, right? What's log square n? Let's say that you have a billion, uh, or if it sizes billion, log square n is something like 100, okay, or 200. That gives you a huge amount of parallels. So a, a, a typical parallel program can create, create millions, if not billions, of threads, right? And that becomes an overhead. So how do you deal with that? So what we proposed is that, is that you just, because there's so much parallelism, you just don't create parallelism until you've done enough work to amortize it. It's sort of like going on vacation after earning it, instead of going on vacation all the time. <laughs> so you publish a paper, you take some vacation. That's a good, that's a good way to live, you know. You earn some money, you go on some vacation. That's a good way to live. You get your A, you go on vacation. That's a good way to live. So that's sort of the, that's sort of the heartbeat idea, is that you do some work, and when you find enough work, by work, sequential real work, then you, you earn the right to create a thread, and you do so. So that, Okay. Turns out, really, uh, basically what we observed is that you can create the number of threads that you create by like 90%, but the speed ups just remain exactly the same. And shows you basically so much parallel in a typical parallel program that you don't actually take advantage of every single thread. You can do this by changing your code too, but what's elegant about this is that schedule it does it, so you don't have to, as a program, you don't have to yeah, I mean, the, we didn't actually talk about this, but in order to make a lot of what we do here efficient, so if you look at the under, under the hood in the sequence library, it does this automatic course, coarsifying. It's that when we did this divide and conquer for like these divide and conquer algorithms, you went all the way to the base case. It was completely parallel. The overhead head of that is just way too high. Okay, so what we actually have in our code is for implementation of math and reduce, we basically say, 
when you're down to a sequence of size of 1,000, do that sequentially. And so you basically, it's got a condition in there. The problem with that is you don't know how much work each leaf is doing if there's a high order function. And it could be that you waste, that actually you need that extra parallelism because each of there's a very heavy weight. And so it's very hard to decide what that granularity is. And that's exactly what this heartbeat says. It says the user doesn't have to decide it. The system's actually going to measure the work and say, as soon as you've done enough work, then you create the right granularity. So it's dynamically choosing the granularity to avoid the extra cost of these forms, which are going to, if you really went to the bottom line, all you're doing is an and, you're creating a parallel job to do one addition, you know, it's going to be horribly expensive. And then the idea is to, to avoid that. <clears throat> Any other questions? Okay, well thanks for listening in to us. And